Well, hello everyone. This is Professor White, and this is a lecture on the drugs that are used to treat fungal infections. So, welcome to antifungal drugs. So, fungi are actually a pretty large group of organisms, if you will. We often think of them as mushrooms. Remember the old joke, who wants to hang around with me? I'm a fun guy sort of deal. Um, but this also includes the yeast and the molds. And all of these things can infect a human body. So when a person has a fungal infection, that's called a mycosis. And when we look at people's skin, uh, dermatophytes are fungi that can actually cause the skin infections. Um, these would be things like um, tinea pedis, tinea corporis. And when somebody actually has the fungal skin infection, the overall name for those is uh, dermatomycosis or the fungal skin infection. Some fungi are actually the part of the normal flora of the skin, mouth, intestines, and the vagina. So they're a part of our biome, if you will. Not all are disease causing. The skin condition that you see here is actually called a tinea ungium or onchomycosis or onychomycosis. And this is a uh, chronic fungal infection of the toenails, sometimes the fingernails. And this is usually caused by one of the candida species, sometimes trichophyton. And once this occurs with people, it's like a lifetime fungal infection of the feet or also the fingers. So a quick little difference of the difference between yeast and molds. And so yeast are a single cell and molds are multi-cell. Yeast, they bud. In fact, we use how yeast reproduce that budding. They bud rather rapidly in most cases because that's how our bread rises. Uh, so when we're using active yeast and we know that our, our dough doubles in size, that's because the yeast has budded. And molds, uh, they tend to make spores and go off that way. And you can see uh, they have these long filaments. Those are called hyphae. So you see there. And not every yeast is bad, clearly, and not every mold is bad. It's just the ones that infect into the body that are bad. You see here some agar growing some mold in there. So that those would be uh, a terrible thing if you ask me if my patient's blood culture isolated that. So four different types of infections in general. So we have cutaneous, subcutaneous, superficial. So those are various layers of the skin. Those are often just rather annoying and so can be chronic and definitely we do have some treatments. However, the systemic is the one that can be absolutely life-threatening. And we see those more often in our patients who are immunocompromised. We see them in patients, especially with HIV, AIDS, and some other conditions that would make a person immunocompromised, including like skid and things like that. Uh, so not very common for a healthy person to be infected with a systemic mold infection. Okay, so you have here Candida albicans. This is the oral version of it. So this is oral thrush. It's a very contagious infection. It is more common among neonates and young infants and elderly and those who are immunocompromised. This is also very uh, probable to happen if our patients don't rinse their mouths out after steroids, uh, steroid inhalers. And the treatment for this really is nystatin. Nystatin is an antifungal medication. It is in the polyenes class, so basically stops the growth of the fungi that caused the infection. So it's very, uh, very helpful against the candida species of fungi. In the case of treating oral infections like this, if, uh, if it's a young person, a young child, or an infant, you also give the, often give nice statins, swish and swallow. But you can also do troches, lozenges, there's different forms of nice statin that based on the area of the body that you're treating would be what is used. Another common infection would be candidiasis or the vaginal yeast infection. And for our patients who are being treated for this, um, 
couple of points for teaching for them. And again, these are fairly common for females, especially after taking antibiotics, more common in pregnancy. If a person has diabetes because of the, I guess, the sweetness, the sugar. And those with The words just escaped me, but I would say hormonal imbalances. So our female patients who are taking antifungal medications need to abstain from sexual intercourse until treatment is completed and the infection has resolved or else um, it can cause an, an infection in the male, not as commonly, but they can also reinfect them back. Medication needs to be taken for its full course. Even if a person was to start their menses or anything, um, that's not a contraindication to taking it. The medication that's often given is one of the azole medications, usually fluconazole. And the other thing I'll mention is that fluconazole is also available as a, an oral dose. So sometimes for patients, they don't want to do the topical, um, then it's, it's, easy enough to get them a single dose of fluconazole to treat a vaginal infection as well. All right, so let's look at the different groups of medications. So we have the triazoles, which contain fluconazole, itraconazole, voriconazole, and some of the others. And then the imidazoles, which has ketoconazole. So let's put them all together and just remember that they all end in azole. So those are the azole medications. So what's really the difference? Um, and why are they in two different classes? Is Really, the triazoles are the newer versions, and the imidazoles is kind of like the older generation. Uh, but they all are very similar structure. It really just has to do with the um, nitrogen atoms in the azole ring. So some of the other imatazoles would be medications like clotramazole, um, teoconazole. So you may see them out there. The most common would be ketoconazole, clotramazole. And the triazoles, meaning that they have three nitrogen atoms, would be fluconazole, itraconazole, and voriconazole. And I think the other one is, is posaconazole, which isn't as, uh, as common. The echinocandins, that would be things like uh, caspofungin, mycofungin. These we give uh, IV quite often for fungal infections. Some of the other ones. So systemic, most of these can be given systemically. The polyenes, those amphotericin B formulations, those are some of the big guns and they treat systemic hard to treat infections. So let's go a little bit into the mechanism of action. So amphotericin B can be fungostatic or fungicidal, um, just depending. It does bind to the fungal cell membrane, which enables the permeability of the cell and kind of lets the contents ling out, uh, leak out. And it does not affect human cells. And that's the same with nystatin. As we get to amphotericin B though, we'll just have to remember that this is a really highly toxic medication and to make sure that we're being safe during the administration for our patients. Um, the azole medications, and again, I, I put some highlights on the most common ones you're going to see. These are um, used, they can be systemically and otherwise, uh, but a couple little things about these. So the azoles tend to increase the effects of oral anticoagulants because why wouldn't they, right? But as a result, excess bleeding can occur. And also some of the, some of the things that we should think about, um, like some of the medications are contraindicated if they're administered with medications that are metabolized by cytochrome P450. So things like quinidine because of the risk of serious cardiac dysrhythmias. And that would be voriconazole because you can see, and again, that's just one of them, but the, the main one, 
that it can um, basically how it works with P450 it can give you some problems with other meds that are also metabolized there the echinocandins again these are the ones that end in fungin these are fungicidal and the caspofungin is probably one of the more common ones, caspofungin and mycofungin. Um, but they're used for treating of the aspergillus species, especially caspofungin. So if we try other medications and the patient still remains ill, this would be the one for them. While we are on the topic of caspofungin, some of the most common adverse effects of caspofungin include fever and phlebitis at the site of infusion. Because caspofungin is given IV, it's a very narrow spectrum. It's highly protein browned. And this is one of those that um, if we have certain folks who are considered to be cytochrome P450 inducers, that might actually lower the caspofungin levels. So they might need an increased dose. And they may need to have a decreased dose for anybody with liver impairment. Some of the other adverse effects of caspofungin would be paresthesia, tachycardia, tachypnea, headaches and rashes, and allergic reactions. So things like rashes and facial flushing and pruritus. So make sure we're assessing our patients for any sort of histamine mediated reaction. Again, Caspofungin is used to treat systemic aspergillosis or candida infections when other therapies have failed. In general, these are antifungal contraindications or things that we really need to take note of and let the providers know if this is in the history that we see. So of course, any allergy to the medication would be a contraindication. Liver failure, because many of those are metabolized in the liver or and also renal failure. If somebody has a history of porphyria, which is very rare, but if they did, then they should not have griseofulvin. Itraconazole, which is often used for the treatment of fungal toe infections and uh, nail infections. If a person has cardiac issues already, like severe cardiac problems, then that would not be a med for them. And then voriconazole should not be used in pregnancy. And of course, the reason we would use these antifungals would be for fungal infections. Now, they can range from the very mild, sort of annoying, cutaneous infections all the way to the life-threatening systemic. Well, the medication that is used is really dependent on where the infection is. If it's isolated in the blood, then we need to have a systemic infection IV. Topical solutions and sort of treatments are, are fine for things that are confined to the upper layers of the skin. Amphotericin B is a very, very important and strong medication. Again, it's very toxic as well, but for severe systemic fungal infections, it is only available IV. Fluconazole is one of those that, uh, we use for patients who have cryptococcal meningitis and patients don't just get cryptococcal meningitis. This is one that occurs in the face of other immunocompromised states already. Here are some of the adverse effects of a couple of the medications. So fluconazole, which is commonly given lots of GI issues and because of its metabolized in the liver, you could have elevated liver enzymes, so be careful anybody with liver or kidney dysfunction. Nystatin, if it's taken orally, can cause some GI disturbances and decreased appetite. So we're back on the liver again. This is just a slide to once again reinforce the cytochrome P450 enzyme system and its role with antifungal drugs and what can happen if we give multiple drugs that are metabolized by the same system in the liver. Nystatin is a commonly used medication. Outside of the small amount of adverse effects for it, it's really well tolerated and is used on neonates all the way up to grandma and grandpa. Okay, uh, 
again, different ways that we can get this medication to clients would be troches, uh, suppositories, one way or the other, um, swish and swallow, swish and spit. If you're having the patient swish and swallow, remember that the amount of time that the medication has in contact with the infection, the better it is. So don't have them just swallow it right away. Have them really swish it around and, and then swallow it down. All right, so let's spend a little bit of time talking about amphotericin B. So remember, amphotericin B is one of the polyene antibiotics. Most of the major side effects are related to the infusion itself. And these would include fever, chills, rigors, nausea, and headache. Almost all patients who are given this drug intravenously will develop those. They can also develop hypotension, um, arthralgia, myalgia, nausea, vomiting. And it's very common then that pretreatment with something like acetaminophen as an antipyretic, antihistamines, antiemetics may be used to decrease the severity of these side effects. These sort of, are they really side effects? More adverse reactions, but they're very common, very expected. Uh, it can cause some neurotoxicity. So to make sure that we're monitoring our patient for the neurotoxicity signs and symptoms, which you see there. And we need to make sure we're monitoring our patients as soon as this infusion is beginning. Vital signs have to be monitored frequently. And we're looking for adverse reactions, including those cardiac dysrhythmias, visual disturbances, paresthesias, uh, which would be a sign of neurotoxicity. So paresthesia means numbness or tingling of the hands or feet. Any respiratory difficulty, any increased pain, uh, the chills. And if those effects are severe or a severe reaction occurs, then you need to stop the antib this antibiotic infusion and contact the provider. Some of the ways that we can decrease the risk of these is to make sure we are giving the infusion over the prescribed time. And a lot of times these are given over even up to six hours. Some of the other adverse effects uh, would include nephrotoxicity and then hypokalemia. So always monitor your patients for signs of potassium loss. So think to yourself, what are some things that a patient may show us that tells us that they have hypokalemia? So what are the signs and symptoms that you could see? Some of the other concerns that can happen would be bone marrow suppression and of course, anaphylaxis. So as far as medical care during this time, this nursing care, remember to make sure our clients have a definitive diagnosis before starting this because this medication is very, very strong. Um, IV, if it's, if you need IV administration, treatment is usually six to eight weeks long for fungal infections, frequent vital signs and assessments. IV fluids are often given to, with the infusions to decrease the impact on the kidneys. And we need to monitor routine blood tests, including, um, potassium, creatinine, hematocrit, and liver enzymes. But again, this one is really, really hard on the kidneys. Make sure your IV solution is clear, no precipitates. And this is why there's been an attempt to make these new lipid formulations of amphotericin B. They will reduce the incidence of the adverse effects and increase efficacy, but the problem is that they're much more costly. So you'll still see this big guy around. All right, so one of the last things to talk about would be some of the nursing implications for giving these medications. Of course, we want to have very careful patient assessment before starting on the uh, these treatments. So that's that's kind of up to us, making sure we know what their baseline looks like, make sure we have vital signs, CBCs, liver function, renal function. If not, ask the doc why not and see if you can get them ordered do an EKG, make sure that we know the baseline cardiac function, 
Because remember, many of these medications can cause dysrhythmias, especially that big guy, amphotericin B. Thorough med history, looking for any reasons they shouldn't have certain medications. Look at that uh, medications that may be potentially metabolized through cytochrome P450. Be careful with your reconstitution administration. Make sure you're following pharmacy and package insert directions appropriately so that you have the right dose for your patient. In the case of amphotericin B, again, we're always going to want to use an infusion pump and check those vitals every 15 to 30 minutes while the patient's receiving it and their intake and output while receiving them. Um, some of the oral forms, we should definitely give them with meals to decrease GI upset. Others really shouldn't be, so be sure to check with the um, prescribing information before giving them. Remember to assess for potential hypersensitivity, contraindications, etc. before starting it. And then what are we looking for, right? We monitor for the therapeutic effects of this medication set, decreased signs of infection, improved energy levels, and making sure that they obtain or maintain normal vital signs, including their temperature. All right, guys, so that's the end of this presentation on the antifungals. I'm leaving you with this cartoon. Couldn't really find a good fungal one. I did get some interesting pictures as a result, but nothing I'd love to share here. Um, so just a cute little cartoon with the road runner and uh, the nurse saying, everything looks okay to be not kinked. So why does it keep beeping? Have a great day.